This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Welcome to the politics of everything. Today my guest is Jessica to Honshuk, who rose to fame in 2016 on the Australian reality TV show My Kitchen Rules. Since then, Jessica has been busy building up her latest venture called Lifestyle by Jessica, which is a combination of health, fitness, and of course, food. We are thrilled to have her here today to discuss the politics of everything. Hi there, Jessica. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you, Amber? Excellent. So the politics of healthy living, it's um it's definitely a big, big topic. So let's see if you can maybe guide us through it. I know from my own observation, you know, wellness is a modern phenomenon right now in Australia. And I guess a lot of us are quite sort of, you know, into the idea of clean eating and eating better and exercising. But for you personally, what does healthy living mean? Um, personally, for me, healthy living right now at my age, 31, I have learned not to listen to any fad diets, not to, I don't know, go with anything that's it's not going to be sustainable within my life. So I listen to my body. I've been in my body for 31 years, so I should know it quite well. Um, when I feel like I, I need something, I'll take that. And if I'm not sure, I will go to my doctor get a blood test, see where everything is. You know, females, we're quite often low in iron. So, you know, I just fix the little things that are wrong with, you know, all of the vitamins and minerals in my body and just listening to myself. Okay. That sounds really good, sensible advice. And I guess someone, you know, like yourself who has had a profile, so you're on My Kitchen Rules last year. What did the experience of being on a reality TV cooking show teach you about attitudes to food and maybe how and what we eat? Okay. That's actually a really, really good question. For me personally, it taught me that my relationship with food, this is going to be quite shocking to a few people, but my relationship with food was in fact unhealthy and it was brought to my attention by the uh, My Kitchen Rules psychologist that from the first time that she met me, she said that she thought I had a slight eating disorder, not bulimia, not anorexia, but just psychologically the way that I looked at food and how obsessed I was with it was in fact unhealthy. So since then, it's really taught me that I need to live with a little bit more balance. I need to be a little bit more relaxed. And I've done a lot of research for myself, studied, you know, nutrition, read different books. And I did realize that she was in fact correct. So I'm thankful for the experience, like in my personal case, and I'm better for it. That's um, really amazing and thank you for being so transparent with with us today. I guess, you know, a show like this also, there's a lot of, um, I guess, restaurant-style foods which in my mind we're not meant to be eating every day. You shouldn't be eating maybe three-course dinners and lots of cream and all the things that we love. Um, Is there a discord perhaps between what we're seeing on, say, a program like that as wonderful it is to watch and, you know, makes us all want to run out and buy the ingredients and make (laughs) restaurant-style food and what we should be eating on a daily basis? Definitely. Um, You know, not any, oh, well, I don't know anyone in my personal life that sits down to dinner every night and has a three course meal. It is unrealistic. Although it's called reality television, in reality, not many people live like that. And if you were to take that as, you know, the way that you should be living your life, then you're not going to be very healthy. Like you said, all of the cream and all of the sauces. In fact, for dinner, I, I probably tend to have, you know, Protein as a female, about 100 grams of protein, some vegetables, olive oil, sauces. You know, for me, I think something like rice is okay at lunch. I think a piece of toast for breakfast, but for dinner, no. It's like let's let's say we finish work at about 5, 6 p.m. By the time we get home after we go to the gym, 8 o'clock, a three-course meal at 8 o'clock, you'll be eating until 11 p.m. 
and going to bed with a full stomach. Absolutely. And I guess you need to digest and it's obviously the time when your body is also going to be in the rest mode. So perhaps digesting big meals is not is not realistic. And I think most of us kind of know that, but I think it's that sort of program is really brought to the fore, I guess, a bit of competitiveness mm-hmm. in all of us about how we plate up, if you like, or cook. Um, and obviously food is a body fuel, but it also needs to be pleasurable. So you talked a little bit about your own issues in the past. So how can we get that balance be- without becoming a slave to a regime or a diet or critiquing every meal? Do you have any sort of tips to help guide us? Well, I think that, you know, everything in moderation and that's how we should all be eating. You know, I'm quite lucky that I have a quite a fast metabolism. So I can be a little bit more lenient, although I'm not. Um, I can be more lenient, but everyone's different. I think I, I briefly mentioned before that, you know, I went to see my doctor when I thought that something, you know, wasn't right. My energy levels weren't right. Your doctor's a really, really smart per- person. They're very approachable. And if you want to change your diet and you want to know how your body works, you could either visit your doctor or a nutritionist. I can't speak for other people and I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't want to give the wrong information, but seek help from the people that can and see what works for you. Absolutely. And I think that's that's sensible advice. The, the doctors and the medical specialists have been trained, I guess, to, to help guide us and understand what's each individual body might be going through and how mm. best, I guess, to treat that. If you've got diabetes or underlying conditions, obviously, exactly. you know, the best people to chat to about that. And I guess, you know, stepping back a little bit, before you were a contestant on My Kitchen Rules, were you cooking for a living or how did you actually decide to go on this program with your best friend? Okay, well, a part of the show, you have to be a home cook. So, no, I wasn't cooking for a living. I was super passionate about food. I always have been. Um, As a young teenager, I'd go to my best friend's house after school and I'd cook us dinner and then I'd go home and eat my mum's dinner. (laughs) So I'd have a double dinner, which is, I don't recommend that now, but you know, I was a growing teenager. Oh, as a teenager, the fast metabolism, I'm sure that's, that's totally (laughs) understandable. It was, it was very funny. So I used to eat two dinners. Don't recommend it. Um, so I would say for about 18 months, Marcos, you know, was saying, why don't you go on that show? And at first my response was, I've got no one to go on with. And then, you know, we all have our little self doubts. So, you know, my next thought was, am I good enough? And it wasn't just Marcos that was saying to me, you should go on that show. It was a couple of years of people, you know, saying, Jess, I think you should really do that. And once Marcos kind of put out, like, you know, planted the little seed and said to me that, you know, he would go on the show with me and our relationship, our friendship, uh, like, you know, blossomed into such a strong bond. I thought, you know what? we can do this. So I applied, like we talked about it at length. And I said, you know, we researched like what kind of time frame and things like that. And we applied and it was a really full on process to get on it. To be honest, it's not easy and it's very challenging. And we just pushed and pushed and fought and we got our place. So we were very happy. Yeah. Well done. It just goes to show, you you know, a bit of tenacity and uh, just going for it. You never know where that can lead. And I think that's great advice for anyone, no matter what they're doing. Changing tack a little bit, um, the statistics aren't good for Australia in terms of obesity. In fact, over the next 10 years, a University of Sydney study from February this year says that one in three adults are going to be obese in the next decade. That's shocking. So Mm -hmm. we all know we should be eating cleaner and moving more. But a lot of us have, you know, desk jobs, we travel, it's long days, the technology is not making that better. So are there any sort of simple tips that you've kind of cultivated that can help people make some simple, maybe life-changing tweaks to their lifestyles? Yeah, I think that one really important thing for anyone is to perhaps not go with fad diet. You know, it, it really, like we talked about before, diabetes and things like that, you might have diabetes and not know it. So you'll enter into this crazy fad diet and you'll be doing more harm to your body than not. So I highly, I don't know, I, I do not recommend doing fad diets. Um, like I said before, listening to your body and understanding, you know, if, if eating bread makes you feel sick, then perhaps don't eat bread. 
you know. Another thing that I would have to say that I've done in the past when I wanted to know, you know, what what fuel was going into my body and what I was putting out, there are so many apps now that we can download on our phones. So if you were to go online and type in, you know, what is my ideal, we'll say kilojoules because we're in Australia, what is my ideal kilojoule like intake, daily intake? And there are programs that come up and you can type in, you know, your age and your height and your weight and all of these things about yourself. And they'll give you an average kilojoule intake for the day. You can like mine, I think, sorry, as like for my height and everything was around 8,000. That's great. So so I think, yeah, the technology can be our friend in that that instance. And you did touch on the idea that, you know, it's there is a lot of conflicting advice when it comes to the wellness sector. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've gone through various kind of trends, if you like. Some people it's about not eating carbs. Some people it's about low GI carbohydrates. That works for me because I have insulin resistance. Um, some people it's being vegan or paleo diets. It's a bit of a minefield, to be honest, Jessica. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how can we kind of simplistically wade our way through that and decide what's best? Okay, well, as as you know, like each individual is different. So if you're, you know, I don't know, a, a proper celiac, obviously you're going to avoid all of the things that you have to. But beyond that, I, I would say to use all of these apps to your advantage. There are apps that you can type in Chobani uh, Light Yogurt, one tablespoon. It will give you the exact, exact kilojoule content. So like I said, work out how many kilojoules you're meant to be eating, And then, you know, you can type every last thing that you eat into this app and it will tell you your kilojoule intake. And then you'll know exactly how much exercise you're going to have to do to burn off this, this amount of food that you're eating. So keeping in mind with your your dietary requirements and going from there. Absolutely. I guess um, you've got your new business and wellbeing program, Lifestyle by Jessica. What are you offering people and and why, why did you decide this is the path you wanted to take? Okay, well, Lifestyle by Jessica it incorporates, you know, health, fitness, well being, not just one, not just diet, not just exercise, overall. So, everything that we need in life to, to make ourselves feel good. So, a website is underway at the moment, and I'm working really hard on recipes. So, I'm working on an ebook. I will be, you know, uh, people can subscribe to Lifestyle by Jessica. And at the moment, like I said, I'm not a nutritionist, but I, I have, you know, people in line that are, and we can offer people advice um, for free. And the ebook will be available to, to purchase online. Um, I also want to incorporate something that's really important to me, um, more so in Melbourne here, because it's where I live. There's community fitness. I just call it community fitness, like free fitness classes that are available all the time. All the time. There's really no excuse. We need to know. Yeah. So I want to incorporate a little blog that that tells people, you know, there's a free boot camp here, you know, so that health, fitness, it's available to everyone and it is free. You can you can exercise cheap. If you don't like running around the park, you know, if you want to do boxing, there are free boxing programs. You just have to know where they are. So I want to give people that information as well. So it sounds like your role is really to help sort of facilitate and educate people about the whole, you know, being being healthier and fitter and how, how to get there, which is fantastic. I guess personally, what really motivates you to champion healthy living? Is there any sort of personal experiences that, um, you know, can explain why why you think it's so important that we take care of our bodies in this way? Okay. Well, growing up, I was a gymnast. And I think that from that, from the exercise, from, you know, my body just always craved healthy things. As a child, my, my favorite food was salad. And where I grew up with I don't know. Like that we is do know that for Sorry. a child to crave salad. I have to say, I've got two sons, <laughs> and I don't think yeah. they've ever craved salad. Yeah, when I was a little girl, and I always wanted my dad to make my salad. My dad or my grandmother. Like when Mum made my salad, it wasn't as special. But so I'd go to my dad in his garage. Dad, I'd be pulling on his shirt. Dad, Dad, can you make me a salad? And I'm like, Come on, make me a salad now. And he would always um make my salad, and he'd get the fork, and I'd, I'd look at his face, and he'd have a smirk on his face. And he'd start eating it. And I'm like, no, dad, it's my salad. He's, and he always said to me, he's like, I'm just making sure it's not poisoned. And he'd eat half of my salad. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> what a great yeah. story. So it sounds yeah. like healthy living is something that's been always part of, you know, you and your upbringing. And now you're sort of moving this forward with, with your business, Lifestyle by Jessica. 
Do you have any mentors or inspirational figures that kind of, even if you can't name names, that have kind of helped you on this journey that have really informed you and motivated you? To be honest, one of my my most inspirational people in my life is is my grandfather, my Polish grandfather. Growing up, you know, he loved all of the finer things. You know, he had beautiful cars, silk tiles. He listened to classical music. You know, I think the reason that I played the flute and piano as a child is because when I was a little girl, we'd lie down together in his bed in the afternoon and we'd listen to, you know, all of this beautiful classical music and we would share like, you know, Polish obviously so we get out a spread of meats and all of these pickles and I think just that that kind of lifestyle and you know he'd always say to me we're eating this fish this is really healthy this is good for you and he he instilled those things into me when I was a child and I think that's carried through with me when I was a gymnast you know all of like I think Nadia Comaneci was one of the the biggest things in my life you know she was amazing but I was too little to understand diet and things like that. But as an adult, I think that, you know, I really look up to uh, Luke Hines, who is also a ex-MKR contestant. But, you know, having met Luke um, just randomly, very, very randomly, um, I was at work one day and he came in and we had a great chat. And since then, we've caught up a few times at different events. And I think the way that he lives his lifestyle and the way that he tries to educate people the same way that I do is you know, he, we're just in line and I, I, I really look up to him. He's he's a really good guy. He wants the best for everyone. So Luke's definitely uh, someone I look up to. Yeah, I agree. It's always important to have different types of mentors and people that inspire you. And it sounds like some of them are family and some of them, have, of course, become friends as well. And you've touched on your Polish heritage. What sort of role do you think culture plays in our understanding of what makes healthy living possible? Well, I think that I guess because my my dad's Polish background and my mum's Australian British background, and I think that just the way that my father was brought up and like you know that I don't know um, they would always have a proper meal. We would always sit down at the dinner table. It was never fast foods, you know. It was just that old school mentality of you know we don't need to waste money on fancy foods. Like we need fuel for our bodies. I think that that really old school way of eating taught me to be healthier you know like we didn't have I think maybe once a month my mum and dad would treat us to a burger or something because we didn't eat food like that. I agree I must admit I'm sort of my heritage is um, you know, South African Jewish and, and English if you like mm-hmm. Australian on my dad's side and um, sitting down to eat together has always been something that was important so like you say, I think also generationally there wasn't as much access to fast food and it just wasn't something you did unless you were sort of on holidays or, you know, on the road and there was nothing else to get. So I think I know my family, even though we're so busy, we do try to sit down, you know, a few times a week as a family, no devices, no distractions, enjoy the food we have as a family and and have a meal that we share because I think that education process like you've touched on for you is really important so people understand that food, yes, it's fuel, but it's also about family and culture and bonding and appreciating the meal in front of you rather than scoffing down something while you're perhaps doing some work at your desk. So perhaps that's also something that I think is missing, um, you know, at the moment with the way which we eat. Yeah. One thing that I find is really important. Now, I know I don't have children, so I can't talk firsthand, but And I'm not saying that schools don't have programs for nutrition and education on nutrition, but if the government, I feel that if the government was more, a little bit more harsh and if they had like from, I don't know, children go to school at the age of five, from the age of five, if we were actively learning, just like maths, just like English, nutrition and what we're meant to be putting in our body, where vegetables come from, educating kids more thoroughly from a very young age on nutrition and what's right and wrong, I think that, you know, if their parents came from a different generation in, uh, let's call it a lower socioeconomic area, and they weren't aware of what was healthy and not healthy, the kids could be educating their parents and these kids could educate their children. I think that, I don't know, it, it might be a little bit harsh to say that it's negligent that all schools don't have mandatory nutrition for children, but I think that would be a really good step towards the future given the obesity epidemic. 
Oh, look, I do think there's some merit in what you're saying and I, I think it's been left up to in some ways parents and um, it depends, of course, where the school is and, you know, which demographic it's in I think as well. But mm. it's hard to dictate what people should and shouldn't be eating. But I think, you know, if the kids also can come home and say I really want to have a fruit bowl that we can access rather than pulling out packets of chips after school or, you know, yeah. and I think I think it's someone like a Jamie Oliver who's done a really great job through his profile on going into schools in the UK and changing, I guess, how they see food, knowing where it comes from. That's, that changes everything. If you can grow veggies in your garden or herbs and you get kids excited and they might not all want to cook all the time, but if they understand where the food's coming from and have some joy in that, I think that changes how they feel about it too. Yeah. So just to wrap up, you know, we've had a fantastic chat over so many different topics. If you could sum up for us just maybe two or three top tried and true practical tips for listeners on the politics of healthy living, what would it be? What could we all do today? What can we all do today? I think my number one rule would always be to listen to your body. So if you are really tired or, you know, there's something that's constant in your life, stop ignoring it. Go to the doctor, take the time, have a blood test, be proactive, stop ignoring the way that you feel. If you don't feel 100%, work on it. It's possible. I think that's number one. Uh, yeah, number I two think you're right. is be active wherever you can. You know, like if you work in an office, don't eat your lunch in the office, go out for a walk to the park, just change your environment. It will help you be to be more open to, to many things. Um, so yeah, exercise when you can. I know that people are busy, but if it's only 10 minutes a day that you can achieve, use that 10 minutes wisely. You know, your brain, the uh, chemicals that you'll be producing in your brain will help you. You'll feel better. Everything will be better with exercise. And number three, I think, you know, make food fun. Don't starve yourself. Don't think that you only have to have carrot sticks. There's so much sugar in carrots anyway, so you don't want to do that. But make food fun. Treat yourself. Don't deprive yourself of anything. Just go with it and keep it fun. And I think that that's a really good way to not make food a chore. Food shouldn't be a chore. It should be fun. Absolutely. We've loved having you on the politics of everything. If you do want to connect with Jessica, we'll have some details of her website on our show notes. You've been listening to the politics of everything. I'm Amber Danes. Until next time, keep well. I'd like to take this moment to thank the hundreds of people who have given me some great feedback in the early stages of the Politics of Everything podcast. It's a big thing to take on a new project like this, and I have really been overwhelmed by the great feedback and reviews which people have posted either through iTunes or Podbean, Google Play or Stitcher. In particular, I'd like to say thank you to LaunchPod for her fantastic comment on the day we launched um, about the series being thoughtful and uh, had a great approach to it. So I thought that was um, really encouraging, especially on the day we launched. And also from Papalotta, who said the excellent show that digs deep on important topics. Apparently, I have an easy interviewing style and my guests are knowledgeable and generous. Great work. And a third one from overseas, actually from the USA, from Kay Kantz saying, well done, Amber, some very insightful discussions, especially the branding and flexible work podcasts. You are an awesome presenter as well. Keep it up. Thank you, everyone. And I do look forward to you keeping those comments coming. Please give us a great rating, recommend us, share it. Um, We want to keep this free and accessible for everyone. Until next time, thank you so much. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network, your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.